Γεια σας, είμαι με τον ε, Μιχάλη Μιχαηλίδη από το κανάλι Ancient Greece uh, Revisited. Uh, first of all, do you have a website or a Facebook page uh, that I can... So where can we find you on the social media, actually? On the social media, so... Um, well, YouTube is our main platform, but we do have a website, more of a holding page. Uh, it's agr-series.com. Okay, right. So it's also going to be uh, in the uh, description um, of the video. Um, λοιπόν, πρώτον όμως, ε, γιατί μιλάμε αγγλικά. Μην ανησυχείτε, αυτό το κανάλι δεν γίνεται ένα αγγλικό, ε, ένα αγγλόφωνο κανάλι. Ε, απλώς ε, ο Μιχάλης ήθελε να, να, να κάνουμε αυτό το βίντεο στα αγγλικά. Ε, για, γιατί ακριβώς, γιατί το, το κανάλι σας είναι, είναι στα αγγλικά. Um, so why, actually that's a good question, so why would ancient Greece, uh, I suppose you're using, you know, English because you want to reach a wide audience, um, so why is ancient Greece relevant to such a wide audience? That would be, uh, you know, a good question which would justify the use of English. Yes, so you, 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 you figured it out. Um, I definitely uh, wanted to reach a wider audience, um, but also I'm going to say something that's a little bit uh, provocative, but I feel like I can say I'm Greek myself. Um, sure. What happens is that even if one wants to uh, address Greeks, mm -hmm. as a fellow Greek, it's better to address a foreigner so that he can then address the Greek that's sitting beside you. Mm -hmm. It's a little weird. I'm sure you know enough of Greek culture to understand. So your brother, let's say figuratively, is sitting next to you, the, the Greek. The brothers are always jealous. So you want to speak to the cousin who went to America, let's say, and if he says, oh, you know, Michael has something important to say, and the Greek standing beside you is going to say, really, this guy? <laughs> I, I, see, I see what you mean. But even if, and you, you know, I get, I'm exaggerating slightly, if I did want to address only Greek, if it was a Greek um, issue, mm -hmm. if it was something to do with Greek literature, for example, I would, I would do the channel in Greek. But it's reaching a wider audience, and even if, even if I wanted to reach Greeks, that would be the way to do it. Right, okay, I understand. Και ξέχασα να το πω, αν δεν μιλάτε αγγλικά, μπορείτε να ενεργοποιήσετε τους υπότιτλους ε, στα ελληνικά, φυσικά. Um, right, so talk to me a bit more about your channel. What, what is it about Ancient Greece Revisited? What's the, uh, the whole idea behind the channel? Yeah, so, you know, Revisited means going back to somewhere you've been. And ancient Greece is a place that in, in a certain way we've all been, uh, whether Greek or, or, or Belgian or, or French, or, um, because it's, it's at the roots, or we are told that it's at the roots of our culture. Mm -hmm. But my question is, do we really understand it? So me, you know, it started like a personal project. I really wanted to see how much I understand of ancient Greece, not, not how much I've read, how much I've understood of ancient Greece. So going back, I, I, I started, I began to see it with, with, with different eyes and, and different than what I've been taught in school and, and different to what most people have been taught in school. So the premise, the way I describe my project, which by the way, currently we're talking about, um, um, I would call the mini documentaries on YouTube, 10 minutes, that, that's what I, I'm and my director together, uh, partner in crime, so to speak, we're, uh, we're producing 10 minutes short documentaries on, on YouTube and a few interviews uh, with people who know much more than I do about specific issues. We just finished an interview uh, with a great uh, Lear player. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something. I saw that. Yeah, that was very interesting. That was one in the beginning uh, and, and now we have another uh, with someone who's, who's much more of a specialist. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, they, we did the filming. It came out uh, great, uh, ju ju just to give you a little hint um, with uh, and linking to the whole Ancient Greece project. Uh, you, uh, you know, uh, Nikos Xanthoulis, whoever wants to uh, look him up, he's a great musician uh, and a great person, I, okay. I, I'll say personally. And uh, we had a preliminary discussion where, you know, I asked him a lot of things about Ancient Greek music, certain theories that I've heard, and he was very much a, a rationalist. You know, he was very much a rationalist. He's, whenever, you know, I tried to bring uh, perhaps a little bit of spirituality inside, he said, yeah, perhaps, maybe, but 
you know, let's keep a sane mind, you know, and, and I like that. I like that honesty and that square, squareness of mind, you know. So we begin the interview, we begin the interview, and I asked him, I said, how did you get, let's say, converted? Because he was a classical musician. Uh, he told me, how did you get converted to the lyre? He said, you know what? I had a moment. Have you heard Pythagoras, music of the spheres? Pyth- Pythagoras believed that one, a philosopher could hear, actually hear, the music of the sphere because every string in a lyre uh, plays a note according to its length. So as planets in a geocentric universe, as pl- different planets have different distances from the center of the earth, if you could translate these distances in music, Pythagoras thought you would hear the, the heavenly music of the spheres. So back to my interview, beginning with this rationalist, he says, you know Pythagoras theorem, but I said, yes, I've heard it. <laughs> and then he went into, <laughs> and I'm only saying it because he said that in public. It was a great, and he went into how he had that moment, a uh, metaphysical moment, as he called it, where he actually heard the music of the street. And, and he said, my whole life was trying to recapture that moment. Okay, so that's a very, I'm mentioning it, and people can see the interview once, once it gets live in a few weeks, but that's a very ancient Greece re- revisited moment. You know, going back and, and, and try to capture something of the lived experience of how it was, okay? To see Greece, try to see Greece with ancient Greek eyes rather than modern eyes, which is mm-hmm. what we do. And once that to whatever degree I can achieve that, you know, my goal is to then use these eyes to look on us and ask the question, how would these people look at us rather than what we're doing, which is the exact opposite. I understand. Now I have to tell you, I really love your channel. Um, I was very impressed when I, when I got that email from you. Um, so I think it's very thought provoking, very innovative. Um, one of the things I really like is that you really don't uh, dumb things down for your audience, you know, uh, which is what some channels tend to do sometimes when they talk about history or philosophy. So it's actually genuinely uh, interesting. And another thing I really like about your channels is that you, you, you sometimes, actually what you do is you, you ask more questions than you provide answers, uh, which, which I think is a great thing. Um, at least in, for example, in your philosophy videos, you really take, um, you, you don't ju- just state facts, you, you really make your audience think, which I think is uh, really great. And another thing I love is how utterly beautiful your videos are. That I was very impressed. I don't know who your uh, editor is. Um, yeah, yeah. But- we are a team of two. Currently, I'm, I'm the, let's say, researcher, writer, mm-hmm. presenter, and Adamandis Petritis is a director, editor, effects, uh, everything to do with visual and co-producing it, you know. Um, so, yeah, and I was very lucky to meet him, actually, and I was very lucky to have this, this collaboration because um, I would have done it anyway, and it would have probably looked very much like it looks now, me on a webcam talking about various things perhaps adding some images. So it, it would have been a very different experience. Right. Well, c- congratulations to him, uh, because honestly, it looks absolutely beautiful, uh, which I think is great. What, one thing I don't like sometimes is, you know, uh, I mean, your channel is called Ancient Greece Revisited. Revisited. Sometimes when people revisit those ancient, uh, you know, a- ancient topics about ancient history, basically, they want to absolutely modernize everything and change the imagery completely and make it a bit vulgar. Uh, to appeal to a very wide audience. I mean, at least that's what they think. Um, and it's like they, I feel like sometimes they don't really respect the beauty of what they're talking about. I don't know if you see what I, what I sort of mean. Um, what I love about your channel is it's absolutely beautiful. And I, I think beauty really matters, you know. It, it absolutely does. I mean, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, on the other side, I understand why, why some people want to dumb this down. And it's not because they're dumb themselves. It's because <laughs> they, they have uh, orders of magnitude, more views. Okay, now, can it be achieved otherwise? I hope so. I'm not going to change my content to have mm-hmm. more views. You know, I always want to get uh, listener and viewers feedback. But ultimately, I, I want to say things the way I... I see them, but I understand this other side. Now, you know, talking about beauty, that, that's very, very important because, 
you know, I, I believe we do live in an age of ugliness to a large degree. Um, there's a great um, documentary, I would say, out there produced by the BBC called Why Beauty Matters, okay? By, by Roger Scruton, right? By Roger Scruton, yeah. Um, very inspiration. It's very telling that the BBC itself pulled this documentary down and now you have to look it up and find it from some, you know, like bootleg, um, I think it's in Portuguese, subtitles, which is very strange, very strange, but it's almost like fulfilling what Scruton is saying in the video that we live in an age of ugliness and lo and behold, this age of ugliness does not accept his uh, exaltation of beauty. It makes perfect sense, you know, once, before you see the documentary, you're like, how, how could this documentary ever be pulled down? You see it, you understand it. Okay, understand. And of course, beauty was tremendously important in ancient Greece because it was far more than decoration, okay? It was, um, it was a gateway. It was a gateway to the divine, for sure. And that, you know, I'm not naive enough to say, I'm going to promise you, I'm going to take you by the hand and pull you through that gateway to the divine. But I'm going to try to peer, peer, peek through it, you know, see what did they see. Well, I, I think you, you're really managing to do that. Um, I think some, some of your videos are a really piece of art, uh, to be honest. I was very, very impressed. So I would really encourage you to go subscribe to the channel uh, right now if you haven't done so already. Uh, it's, a, it's a very small channel so far, but I can see it becoming really big. I think it's got, you know, an incredible uh, potential. Um, right. So basically getting back to the, 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 the main topic, which is, you know, ancient Greece. Um, how much did, he, did it influence the world, basically? What, what, what exactly do we owe to ancient Greece? We keep talking about it, but what, what, what do you think? Yeah, so a lot of ancient Greece passed through, you know, two filters. Uh, yeah. One was uh, the Roman Empire and the other was Christianity. And each took away what they did not like. You know, these two filters, you can say, joined in a third filter, which is modernity, and that took away a lot. Um, the way I like to present this symbolically is through the idea, and, and that's something, you know, it's almost like in our tagline, um, the idea of the white statues and white temples, right? So for centuries, Europe believed that the, the, the great temples, including the Parthenon, were, were just like we see them today, all white. And this later, uh, relatively recently, perhaps 150 years ago, uh, we began to understand that they were not white, they were painted, and they were painted with colors that would be called kitsch today, you know, bright, intense colors. Um, so that, 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 you know, changed, but it's more of a misunderstanding because an entire theory of aesthetics was built upon this misunderstanding. There's a, uh, a French uh, poet uh, or a classist, I do not remember his name, I'm, I'm going to look him up, um, who wrote an ode to the Ac Acropolis, uh, Ode à l'Acropole, I think it was called. And um, he, he, he praised the whiteness of, of the marbles, okay? Back in ancient Greece, however, you have Euripides' Helen, um, Helen of Troy, who, in that tragedy, really, and, and actually in, even in Homer's Iliad, she, she's aware of how much harm she has caused through her beauty, okay? And in Euripides, it's, it's even worse. And at some point she says, oh, if I was born ugly, essentially, oh, if I was born ugly. And the way she says that is, oh, if I was like a statue without color. Okay, so you see, a modern poet, what he sees and what he believes is the apex of, of aesthetics, the whiteness. The ancient poet who lived among these, well, now ruins, then great temples, saw it very differently. He saw whiteness as ugly. So, and, and so recapturing that world, try to recapture the mind that built, built this. What was the mind that liked the whiteness, the modern European mind? But what was the mind that liked the colorful, perhaps the ancient Greek mind? So 
back to your question, you know, we keep on saying, well, you know very well, Greeks are very proud of their past and we, 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 we think we invented everything, including, uh, you know, the ancient Greeks invented anything, in, including the hammer and the, and the microchip. <laughs> but uh, um, again, a lot of this is based on, I, I believe, misunderstandings. You know, the, this idea of white Greece is this idea of rational, uh, near perfect, saintly, even a little Christian, dare I say, the way Socrates is somehow presented, almost as a proto-Christian sometimes, which is not the case in my point. Um, so some, some of Greece obviously became one of the pillars of European civilization, and we know that. I'm trying to recapture the other that didn't flow into the currents of history so much. I see what you mean. That, that's very interesting. So you, you want to show ancient Greece as it really was, as much as possible. It, it, it really well. Yes, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And, and. So I suppose that's what you mean when you said, so you, you want to bring to life a vision of Greece that goes against the whitewash version that British Hellenists made universal to this day. I, I saw that description on your, on your yes. page. So that's what, yeah. that's what you mean, basically. Yes, exactly. That's exactly. Um, did, did you have, when you said British Hellenists, did, did you have any, any specific people in mind? No, I, I didn't have uh, uh, spe specific people in mind. Um, the one episode I did was uh, uh, Gladstone was also a prime minister, you know, he's, he's typical of that. Um, and uh, that would be one name that, that pops into my mind. Um, but there's another one actually yesterday uh, when we filmed that interview, uh, I opened up with something similar. Um, I don't remember, I think the name of that British classicist was uh, Confold or, or something, don't, don't quote, quote me on that. But he, he translated Plato's Republic, you know, and in Plato's Republic, it said Socrates, through the mouth of Socrates that the education of a virtuous citizen is based on two things, okay, two words, logos and musiki. And the translator, the typical of a British classicist, translated that as um, reason and culture, or something like that, reason and culture. But my question is, you know, Plato, uh, some, some 20th century philosophers said that Plato had placed every single word of his text perfectly, including words like the and and. Okay. So what if he did mean music as in musiki, as in music? Obviously not music as in, let's put a song on the um, YouTube playlist. But what if that music, the idea gets lost if you just translate it as culture or, or the liberal arts is how it's translated. You know, what if it had much more to do with the lived experience of listening to something than thinking about it. Okay, so, so that's an example of what uh, a British classes and how the original text that for, for an English speaker just reading it, it would be lost. They would read through that line without understanding that the word that was actually used for the education of the virtuous citizen was music. And to finish this off, in the interview that I, I mentioned all that, and the uh, Nikos Xanthouli, the lyre player, um, showed us the modes, the different modes that musicians might know by names like Dorian, uh, Dorian, Phrygian, Mixolydian, they, 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 which are used throughout music today. You know, even if, if you play like rock music on the guitar, you, yes. will, you, will, you will know these things. And he, he played, uh, again, a French reference, um, uh, Frère Jacques, um, he played Frère Jacques in different uh, modes and the feeling was different. The feeling was different. One was more serious. It was like, yes, Frère Jacques. The other one was more playful, sad. And, and the idea that I hopefully got, got out at that moment was that um, you, you understand how changing, thing, how changing the order of things changes your emotions. So you get to know your emotions just by circling throughout these modes. And going back to Plato and the virtuous citizen, the citizen, perhaps, 
this could be a valid interpretation by learning how, how, how this music, he learns his own emotions, he learns his own self, therefore he can self-govern as a free citizen. Perhaps, perhaps, you know. But listening to the, to the actual music gives you a, a different experience than me talking about it, because you've got music, education, political freedom, how, how, how can this fit? Is it, oh, yeah, I understand, you know, there's different aspects of myself that are revealed by different modes. And I need to pass through all of them to know who I am that, so that I can govern myself, you know, so. And, and talking about Plato, you actually talk quite a bit about Greek um, philosophy. There's also a video on um, Epicurus called the um, yes. Epicurus, the, the uh, poly, uh, polyatheist, you, you called him. I found yes. that very interesting. Yes. Um, so my question would be, how relevant is Greek philosophy today? Well, so, you know, the question is why, why, should, you, why should you read philosophy in general, mm -hmm. starting? And I guess the answer that I would have given you even a few years ago would be, well, you know, it's important to know what uh, certain great thinkers have thought and said or blah, 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 blah. No, <laughs> this is not the reason. This is not the reason. The reason why you want to read philosophy is the same reason for which you want to learn computer programming in the world of the matrix. Okay, matrix as in the film, 1999. Okay, so in the film of the matrix, for whoever hasn't seen it, you have a hero who's essentially trapped inside of a computer simulation. Okay, his body is somewhere else. It's cryogenically preserved is somewhere else, and his consciousness is within this virtual world and he doesn't know it he doesn't know it okay but he suspects it has something to do with computer programs that's why he he himself is a, is a computer programmer by day he works in this well i can relate being a software developer myself i can relate he working in these um, you know faceless offices in his little cubicle by day writing programs for who, who, who knows what big like corporation. And then by night, he's a computer hacker. So he's in his apartment, he's hacking, and that's how he finds the people that will eventually pull him out of that matrix, you know? Um, so he, he has something, he has some understanding that his, the world he lives in has something to do with, 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 with computer programs, but he doesn't know exactly what. So our world is not built by computer programs, but it's built by ideas. Okay, we live in a matrix of ideas. This world we live in, this socially constructed world, was constructed by various ideas, thought by various thinkers. So reading philosophy, it's almost like seeing through the matrix. It's almost like seeing through what you'd be surprised what you'll find there because you'll be surprised how many of your own ideas are not your own. They were, so to speak, implanted to you through various people that you can actually trace the specific individuals back in time. You can say, okay, that thing that half the planet believes now, that person created that, that person first thought about it. You know, uh, this is why you want to read philosophy. To see through the matrix. Right. Is, is there one philosopher or, or, or a, um, you know, a piece of, of work uh, that particularly influenced you in, in terms of Greek philosophy? Is there anything that you found particularly inspiring? Yeah, I've, I found a few things um, inspiring. Um, you know, the first person that caught my attention who, with all due respect, I would not consider him a great philosopher today, but the first person that kind of did it for me was a, a, a Greek philosopher by the name of Dimitris Liandinis, um, who passed away. People who love him usually say he willfully departed from this world, so people understand what that means. Uh, in the late 90s, I think 97, and uh, it was all, all over the news back then. I, I was just finishing school. So it was all over the news. This professor, he was lost. That's what they believed in Taigetos, in the, in the, in the mountain range of, of Sparta, where he was from. 
And uh, later when they realized he was, he was dead, you know, there, there, there were a, a, few, a few things being said about him on the news. And um, shortly after a friend of mine, you know, even back then I had this interest in ancient Greece. So I had a conversation with someone who was a bit older than me. I don't remember what he said, but he came back and said, do you know of this man, Ladinis? I said, yeah, yeah, he's that crazy guy that was lost. He said, no, 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 read his book and read his last book, which is called Gemma. Uh, people listening, I can even find it in English. It's been translated. Uh, not a very good translation, unfortunately. It does not capture the, 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 the Greek. And, and I read it and I was blown away because there you would see a, a, a very, very early version of what I'm doing now. This combination of old and new, almost collage style, you know, haphazardly. Just, just you throw things together, you see what... So Yadinis would be speaking about something that Epicurus said, case in point, connecting it with, with, with Einstein's theory of relativity and a verse from uh, uh, Goethe's uh, uh, poetry and a verse from Cavafy. And somehow, somehow he could see how Cavafy foresaw the theory of relativity or something like that. I'm, I don't want to misquote him. I don't think he ever said this thing exactly, but it is very much in his spirit, you know. So that was the seed that, you know, Greece can be done differently, basically, okay. Following that, uh, a thinker that influenced me very much, a great, an, uh, another Greek thinker called Cornelius Castoriadis. And I had an interview with, not, not the man himself, as he passed away a long time ago, um, with, with an expert on Cornelius Castoriadis called Theophanes Tassis is his name. We had an interview where we tried to go. And Cornelius Castoriadis, you know, he was a man of the, let's say, radical uh, left. He was, a, he was an ardent uh, uh, revolutionary till the end, but he saw in ancient Greek something that others didn't, you know. He saw that ancient Greece was the first society to self-institute, as he would say, you know. So Castoriadis had this very powerful notion of autonomous and heteronymous societies. His idea is that all society... Okay, so he was an atheist, obviously, as a revolutionary Marxist. He was an atheist. He did believe that, to a certain degree, um, religion is the opium of the masses, but he understood that some masses just need to take their opium in history. So he believed that all laws, all morals, all uh, norms are ultimately man-made. Okay, me, you, and a bunch of other people, let's say we start a new city. We legislate, from, we make it up is another way. We, we'll make it up. We'll make it up. Our grandchildren will think that, oh, you know, on that day you shall not eat uh, fruits because blah, 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 blah. We made it up at some point, you know, for whatever reason. Um, but most societies, Castoriadis said, cannot live with this, with this understanding. So they need to attribute their laws to some supernatural authority. Okay, uh, usually linked through ancestors. So my grandfather heard this story from his grandfather who lived in the time of that great king who was the son of God. So ultimately it comes, it always comes from the God. Moses and the Ten Commandments comes to mind. Moses goes, for Castoriadis, Moses was just a dude. He went up, he saw chaos in the, in the, in the Jewish tribe. He said, I need to put, and he just wrote the Ten Commandments. Okay. But when he came down, he said, God, God gave me the Ten Commandments. So that's a typical heteronymous from the Greek, heteros, other, nomos, law. The law is given to you by someone else other than you. An autonomous society, autonomous from auto, myself, is a society that knows that all laws, all norms, all morals, all institutions come from us and can somehow live with this existential burden. And the only such society in the ancient world, according to Castoriadis and to all historians, was ancient Greece. The ancient Greece city-states were the only societies that were religious. They were pious. Piousness, let's not forget, is one of the five cardinal virtues according to Plato and according to other uh, osiotis in, in, in Greece. Um, it was obviously piousness to a different God, not to the Christian God, but it was piousness not, nonetheless. Yet the gods did not legislate. In ancient Greece, no one would have said, you know, that Zeus told me to increase the taxes. 
that will be crazy. Yet, you know, we read in the Quran, for example, that taxation is, is very well defined. How much to levy from whom, you know, perhaps not from the Quran itself, but from, from you know, the scriptures of Islam, one of the four, uh, you know, great books. Um, you have very minute details on how to run your society, you know, down to actual taxation. So this would be unthinkable to the ancient Greeks, not because they didn't believe in the gods. That's important. They believed in the gods, but they didn't believe the gods cared. Why should they? You know, if they're all eternally happy and perfect, why should they care? What we do, what we do in, ta- in, in, in the courtrooms and what we do in the bedroom, you know? And that was very unique. And for Castoriadis, that was the, the seed for a, a modern autonomous society. So he wrote extensively about ancient Greece, whoever wants to find it. He can find, you can find his works in Greece and in French. In Greece, in Greek, it's called Ieliniki uh, Idiaterotita, what made, and in French is Ce qui fait la Grèce, is in French. Um, I don't remember, because he wrote, let's say, some of his books in French, some of his books in Greek, because he lived in France, he was part of that generation that traveled in, uh, to, to, to Paris. Um, so you can find them, they're, they're great works, unfortunately, to, to the degree that I know they're not translated in English. Um, so that was, let's say, my, my second stop. And then my third stop, going from the left to the right, was realizing that, uh, you know, just before the Second World War, there was a movement, uh, a very powerful intellectual movement in Germany, sometimes called the Conservative Revolution, okay, by people who wanted to, they they looked behind the, the, the historical horizon of liberalism, not neoliberal, classical liberals, the Enlightenment. They were, to a certain degree, against the Enlightenment, okay? These were uh, authors like uh, Carl Schmitt. They were authors like Walter Friedrich Otto that I, I'm going to mention in one of their next videos. Martin Heidegger, Leo Strauss. These were, you know, um, and they, they understood something about ancient Greece that others didn't. If one reads Walter Friedrich Otto's The Homeric Gods, you, ha- you get an understanding about Homeric religion and why it's so hard for us to understand that, to my knowledge, n- no other has approached, you know. For most of us, the idea of the Homeric Gods is a little bit awkward, is a little bit funny, you know, um, a giant man going half naked, uh, chasing after virgins, you know. That, but Odo makes a case as to why that is, you know, as to, and to what we've forgotten recently as of modernity is that man is nature. Nature is not just the trees and the streams and, you know, man is nature. The image of that naked man, Apollo, is the image of its perfection of nature. It's the flower, and we are the flower of nature. And, and, and the Greeks worshipped man in his perfection to a certain degree, and they captured that in the Greek gods. And Walter Otto captures that in ways that I can't transmit now, so you have to read um, uh, his book, you know. And um, uh, another great thinker is Martin Heidegger, of course, who wrote again, one of the most difficult philosophers to have existed, yet parts of his works are in Greek, in ancient Greek, because he believed that that language, ancient Greek, was by nature closer to the truth, which is a crazy idea. But basically Heidegger believed that uh, for us it's impossible to think certain thoughts because our language, our modern language, uh, restricts us. But for the Greeks, you know, and to give you an example, he made a he made a big deal out of the word alithia, which means truth, okay? But he said, what does the word actually mean? It's a uh, negation and lithi, forgetfulness, okay? So the idea is that truth is not learning something radically new. It's somehow remembering. 
And where do you remember it from? Which you don't know, but you go to Plato and you see, you know, even Socrates, the famous uh, dialectic or, or meftiki, the, his, his method of bringing out the truth from someone, you know, so not teaching you the truth, but bringing it out, that, that presupposes that you had it somehow from somewhere, you know, and Martin Heidegger believed that, you don't even need Plato because that, 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 that knowledge was there in the world itself for the ancient Greeks, you know, a very different world. So there was this tendency in Germany, which unfortunately, part of it was absorbed by the Nazi party. You know, there's no nice, nice way to say it. Walter Friedrich Hodo, that great classicist, you know, was, was part of that establishment. Martin Heidegger, obviously, it's he has a very famous story, um, even Carl Jung to, to, to a lesser degree. But there was something brewing there, which unfortunately is lost. So between the radical leftist Castoriadis and the conservative revolution of the Weimar Republic, somewhere there, I'm hoping to find Alicia, the truth about ancient Greece. Right. Um, and you, you mentioned, you, you briefly mentioned the uniqueness of Greek uh, city-states because they were, the, the word you used was um, heteronymous. They were, they were autonomous. They, they were, sorry, autonomous as yes, opposed yes. to heteronymous, like, yes, uh, yes. you know, Christian societies, for example. Yes, yes. Um, so we often talk about, we often admire classical Greece, etc. But actually, my question would be, how much are we really talking about ancient Greece? as opposed to ancient Athens, more specifically, to, you know, ab about the, the, the Greek city-state of Athens? Yeah, that, that's a very fair point. That's a very fair point. And uh, the irony is that even when we speak of Sparta, which a lot of people do after the film 300, in a way we also speak of Athens, because the Spartans themselves wrote almost nothing. They wrote very little, uh, if anything, you know. Um, or we, most of what we know about Sparta came from Athens, which is like learning about the Soviet Union from American writer. You can learn a lot of things, but obviously you can learn them with a certain bias. Um, so, so, so even going back to Sparta, you're actually going back to Greece. But there, there is definitely something that saved that, let's say, pa pan-Hellenic, uh, which is in the poetry. So if you go back to Homer, um, you definitely go beyond the horizon of ancient Athens. You know, if you go and this work, you know, if, if you read, going back to what I said, Homer's Iliad and Walter Friedrich uh, The Homeric Gods, you will get an understanding that's not Athenian at all. You know, it's much wilder, it's much... Yet, you, it has the tragic, you know, if tragedy flourished for some weird reason, tragedy proper flourished in Athens, in, 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 in the region around Athens and not anywhere else. You know, obviously the plays uh, continued to be popular for centuries and were played throughout the Greek world, including, you know, Asia Minor, from Rome to Persepolis, you know. And, but written original tragedies were just written within half a century, a century in, in ancient Athens. We don't know why, but the tragic world view goes beyond and before ancient Athens. And you even find it in Homer, you know, when you have a scene where I think it's Diomedes uh, is fighting a Trojan and you have a very classical scene of all, you know, let's say Indo-European epic poetry, you know, from Beowulf to the, to the, to the Bhagavad Gita. And, throughout this cultural matrix, you have this scene where warriors face each other and they announce who they are. You know, they say, I am such and such, son of such and such, son of such, and such. And, you know, going back to Zeus, whatever, and with this spear, I'm going to pierce you through, you know. So, so you have this moment in Homer and Diomedes says, you know, declare yourself, we would say, who are you? Who is your genus, your, 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 your genus, your well, and this, the other person says, why are you asking about my, my genus, about my, my being? All men are related to leaves. All men's being is related to that of leaves who are green for a single moment on the branch 
and then the wind sweeps them away and carries them down with the water uh, into the mud. That is the essence. It, it, that is a, the tragic understanding of life. You know, right there in a moment, in a battle poem, you know, where perhaps any other people would have said, you know, my genius is, you know, this, I come from the mighty kings, of, et cetera, this is, why do you care? Ultimately, we're ephemeral beings, you know, and whatever beauty, it's like, I don't remember who wrote that poem, said um, um, the, the, the beauty, that, that is the beauty of the rose, that it blows and then it goes. And that is the beauty of leaves, and men are like leaves in Homer's Iliad. So you have that, which is beyond Athens, perhaps tragedy flourished in Athens, but that primary tragic point of view was there in Homer, perhaps even before. So you can find something non-Athenian from, from these poems. You, you, you briefly mentioned uh, 300. J just a quick question. What did you think of the way they revisited ancient Greece, by the way? Because that's a very influential, you know, nowadays when people talk about Sparta, everyone thinks about 300. W what did you think of this film? Yeah. Well, you know, in my, in my, in my dreams, in a parallel world, um, instead of that film, you had Ridley Scott, who took uh, a book by the name Gates of Fire, from Stephen Pressfield, and he turned that into a film. And that was the, what should have been 300. Um, and the reason I mentioned, again, Stephen Pressfield's uh, Gate of Fire is a great book to read, uh, to, to, to do what I'm trying to do, you know, to recapture something of that lived experience rather than just glorifying the Spartans. Try to, kind of, and Ridley Scott can carry that because you see, for, for example, you know, the 300 film that you asked me is not unhistorical. You know, obviously it's a film, but it's not unhistorical. It doesn't portray falsehoods. Something like Gladiator, for instance, is largely unhistorical. You know, the people existed, Marcus Aurelius, the, but the story did not play out the way you see it on film. Yet, there was something about this film that captured what must have been to live in the late Roman Empire. You know, that when he smelled the ground, you know, before battle and he smelled to, to, to smell his death, if he could smell death in the, in the, in the ground, um, it's almost like you were there smelling, you know, it's, it, it's, so Ridley Scott has that talent to bring it. And unfortunately he did Kingdom of Heaven, which, the casting, in my opinion, was, was not uh, very good. So instead of that, if instead of that, he took that great script, Gates of Fire, and, and we would have the perfect 300. So me, I, I didn't mind the 300 that existed. I mean, I was surprised to see how popular it was. You know, I, didn't, I did not expect it would be so popular. I like that. I've, I've lived in a few places in the world, and I've seen... Uh, usually it's guys with, with 300 tattooed here, you know, King Leonard. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, it, it, it worked. It worked. You know, it must have been. Um, but I prefer a, 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 Gates of Fire, that book, also, you could also tattoo it. You know, it, 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 it also captures something of the great greatness, but it also captures something of the smell of the ground, you know, which, which I, I prefer. I prefer, I like, I don't understand I'm watching a film. It's a story. I don't mind if a few things are unhistorical, but I want to be transported there you, rather than stay here and see something like a documentary. Is there, do you think there's anything that we as a civilization have inherited from Sparta rather than Athens? So, you know, the, the, I think these two uh, models are are there, like Sparta has been revived or has been, they've tried to revive it in various occasions, like uh, Rousseau admired Sparta, you know, a lot. And to a certain degree, you could say that the Soviet Union was a kind of, re not the Spartan ideal, you know, the Spartans were very proud for being free. They were free, they were, they were considered free by themselves and the Athenians. You know, which, which, which is very strange for us today, such a 
harsh totalitarian. For the ancient Greek words, the Spartans were free men. Uh, I, I didn't think that the Soviet citizen could ever say that for himself. Definitely everyone else could have never said that he was free. But um, there's something about the idea of a state forming the soul of the citizen. You know, that's one, it's one way to go. To, for a state to shape the soul, that, that, that's how the ancient Greeks would have expressed it, most probably. That, you know, the politia shapes the soul of the individual. And, and the other way, of course, is to let the individual in his own bubble of liberty. And I, th I think these two ideals play out throughout the 20th century, and they were playing out now. You know, just, just like, like, like look at the irony that we're living through, okay? Greece went through a terrible uh, version of the world economic crisis. 2008, 2010 is probably when we felt it. 2011, most definitely, you know, with a memorandum. Um, and back then, you know, back then, there were a lot of people who were turning a little bit to the left, you know, uh, myself included, just to... And we were always reminded that you, you, you cannot infringe on liberty. You know, you cannot infringe uh, if someone like Bill Gates, you know, um, has the talent to become a billionaire. He must have the right to become a billionaire, you know. And there's value in that argument. But look at now, another crisis, which is the coronavirus. And now people have changed from Athens to Sparta. And now it's all about the government and the lockdown and we must curb people's freedoms um, to, to for, for, for the greater good. You know, and they're even talking about a new normality, which is very strange, but in a certain way, it's very well, not Spartan in that sense of bravery and self-sacrifice and freedom, but in, in, in that, you know, in that there is an authority that's going to define not only what, how you live, but almost how you think. You know, and we're living through that now. And I think both versions were bad if, if, if you ask me, but it's like we keep oscillating between these two ideas, the totally libertarian, uh, uh, just restrict people on very, very basic things, like thou shall not kill, thou shall not steal, you know, these very bits. Otherwise they can do whatever they want. They can take all the drugs they want. They can have all the sex they want. They can do whatever they want. And the other is no, 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 no. They, we have to mold the individual to a certain ideal. Um, so Spartan Athens is where we all, we're oscillating constantly, I think. Right. Um, j just to clarify that a little bit, you know, when you talk about Sparta and Athens, you, you compared them to modern uh, regimes. And I, I think it's, it's a very widespread idea that Sparta is sort of um, was a, what was a form of uh, fascism or at least a totalitarian regime compar um, comparable to, you know, um, communist Russia or Nazi Germany, whereas Athens was this um, sort of ideal uh, free democracy, you know, sort of an, an, an ancient form of a, of a, of a modern uh, liberal democracy. How accurate is it really to, to, to describe them well, as such? Very good point. It wouldn't be accurate for them. Mm -hmm. the, that's the best I can say. It would not be accurate. The strange thing with Sparta is that back in their time, Sparta was considered almost democratic, which, which, which is something that would shock the modern person. More specifically, it was the ideal of a, a mixed regime, okay, where you would have, you would, in Sparta, in ancient Sparta, you have the kings, the two kings, okay, who came down from two separate royal lineages. You have the two kings. And they would represent, you know, because Aristotle talked about the three regimes, okay? So uh, monarchy, oligarchy, uh, or ar aristocracy, and, uh, and democracy, okay? And Sparta was seen as having created a perfect mix of the three on three different layers. You had the two kings represented the royal monarchical element, well, diarchical to be technically correct. Um, the uh, the Yerusia, which is the Senate, uh, made almost entirely by older um, citizens who had proved their worth, 
Perhaps even some researchers have said that perhaps if you trace their lineages, there is an element of traditional aristocracy in, in them as well, um, or, or some kind of very early like, like priestly class back before Sparta was founded. And then you had the ephors who were voted and whose turn would last one year. And they were literally voted by the people and they would have a lot of power. They would have veto power. Um, you know, so the king had to be on very good terms with the ephors and, and play kind of like a chess game. So, you know, do I woo this particular ephor or do I wait for him to be replaced next year? But who knows? was going to be, you know, um, so there was this constant dialogue and Sparta was seen as the perfect republic, as the perfect mixed regime, not a totalitarian state by modern standards at all, you know. On the other side, you had Athens, which to a certain level did have this almost ideal, you know, direct people's democracy, okay, which of course, you know, and just to correct one thing, you know, because there's a lot of people jumping on this and say, well, you know, but it's, it's only men who had democracy and it's only the free men who had democracy, which is perfectly true. Yeah. Um, but here's why it's wrong. Okay. From, if ancient Athens was a city of 100,000 civilians, let's call them, of which 15 or 20,000 let's say even 10,000, just to be conservative, 10,000 were free citizens, so, so 10,000, you know. So we say that Athens was, was a city of 100,000 res residents with only 10,000 being citizens. Well, we, let's say modern Greece is a country of 10 million where 10 million are citizens. But that's not the way to see it. Ancient Athens was a city of 100,000 civilians with 10,000 members of parliament, 10,000 MPs. Modern democracies are nations of 10 million citizens with 300 members of parliament. So who's more democratic? The That's citizen, a good point. Yeah, the citizen was not your citizen, our citizen today. The citizen was a member of the Congress, was... was someone who could pass laws okay, or suggest laws. So in that view, yes, Athens was very democratic, dare I say, the most democratic society, even with its slaves, even with its slaves. You know, if, if you see it the way I just presented it, the most democratic. But also democracy, let's not forget, was a problem for the Athenians themselves. So you have authors like Plato and Xenophon, who write anti-democratically, because it's the people who invented the damn thing <laughs> that understood its problems. You know, you have to go back, like, like if you go back to the writings of, you know, like tech gurus from the 1960s, who, who were just there in the beginning of the internet, you find many of the tr problems that we're passing through now, you know, this, uh, these great monopolies that are rising, um, Facebook, Google, you, you, you know, they're, they're, they're giants that no one can touch, essentially. And that's partly based on, on the way these technologies were set up. So very early, if, if, if you go back and read some of their writers, you know, they, were, they would write very technically. They would write about network protocols and how one network protocol would favor a certain type of economy and another. And the network protocol that we've... Um, we've inherited, let's say, was almost predicted to give rise to these monopolies, you know, back, back, back in the day. So it's the people who were there inventing the thing that they could make these predictions of how it would turn out. Likewise, the people who invented democracy, you know, if, if there's one thing that I can, I, I, feel, I feel comfortable saying that the ancient Greeks invented rather than developed, that would be democracy exactly for what Castoriadis said, because they were the only ones with this radical autonomy. So, but the people who invented the damn thing also knew its problems. And they also, so someone like Donald Trump would not have been an anomaly for ancient Athens at all. You know, that, 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 that was, they would have predicted that years ago. Right. Um, maybe one last question to uh, wrap up this interview. 
Um, so, for someone who would like to study ancient Greece and to really learn about the, the the true ancient Greece and sort of avoid all those distortions that you mentioned before and the, the ways that some, some people sometimes project the things that they want to see in ancient Greece rather than actually studying uh, things as they were, what would your advice be, apart from, of course, subscribing to your channel and watching your videos, uh, what would your advice be? Read the original text. Read the original text, you know, uh, uh, re read Plato's Symposium again. To, 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 uh, re re read Homer's Iliad, re read Plato's Symposium, read Antigone, Sophocles' Antigone, my favorite tragedy. R read the original thing. That, 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 that's all. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Michael, thank you very much for accepting my invitation. That was a very interesting conversation. Thank you.